To solve a pure time differential equation, d capital F dt equals little f of t, we are given the rate of change, little f of t, of some unknown function capital F of t, and we want to determine what capital F of t is. To be concrete, let's think of the example d capital F dt equals 4t, where the function little f of t equals 4t. To find capital F of t from little f of t, we have to undo the differentiation. That's why we call capital F of t the antiderivative of little f of t. For our example function, it's pretty easy to undo the differentiation. The antiderivative of 4t is the function capital F of t equals 2t squared. You can try it yourself. If you differentiate capital F of t, you will get 4t. Here we plot the function little f of t in blue and its antiderivative capital F of t in green. Now a function has exactly one derivative. What about for the antiderivative? It turns out that a function has many antiderivatives. Since the derivative of a constant is zero, we can add any constant to the antiderivative and its derivative will still be the function little f of t. Hence, we really have a set of antiderivatives, capital F of t plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. On our plot, we can move the graph of the antiderivative up or down, and it is still the antiderivative of 4t. Notice how moving the antiderivative up and down corresponds to adding a different number to the antiderivative 2t squared. We have another name for the antiderivative, the integral of the function f of t, which we write like this. The curvy symbol is the integral sign, and we read it as the integral of f of t dt. The integral takes little f of t as the input and outputs the antiderivative capital F of t plus c. The dt indicates that t is the variable of integration. For our example function, we can write that the integral of 4t dt is 2t squared plus c. In order to integrate or find the antiderivative of functions, we need rules that tell us how to integrate, similar to how we have rules that tell us how to differentiate. Unfortunately, undoing a derivative isn't as simple as taking a derivative. In fact, we can't always find an antiderivative of a function, so there is no foolproof method for taking the integral of any function. Now, we can get quite fancy and figure out tricks to integrate different functions, but let's not take that approach here. Instead, we'll just deal with some simple cases where reversing the derivative rule works out nicely. Then we will be able to find antiderivatives or integrals for some basic cases. One of the first rules you learn for differentiation is the power rule so that you can differentiate functions like t squared, t to the fifth, etc. Here we write the power rule for differentiation slightly differently, where we have t to the power of n plus 1. If we differentiate t to the power of n plus 1, the exponent n plus 1 comes down in front and the exponent decreases to n. The result is n plus 1 times t to the n. We want our result to be just plain old t to the n, so let's divide both sides by n plus 1. Now we have a differentiation rule that gives us t to the n as the derivative. We are all set to reverse the rule and obtain the integration rule for t to the n. If we undo the differentiation of t to the n, we must have differentiated t to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. Thus, the integral of t to the n dt is t to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus our ubiquitous constant c. Now, if n were negative 1, we'd be in trouble as we'd be dividing by 0. So this rule only works when n is not equal to negative 1. Let's try an example, the integral of t squared. To integrate t squared, we must increase the exponent from 2 to 3, and then divide by the new exponent 3. Notice, since we are reversing differentiation, the order is the opposite. To differentiate, you must first multiply by the exponent, then decrease the exponent by 1. To integrate, 
Do the reverse steps in the opposite order. First, increase the exponent by 1, then divide by that new exponent. Here we have obtained our result, t cubed divided by 3. Oh yes, don't forget to add that arbitrary constant c. Of course, we know you are going to forget to put that c down at some point. Try to get that mistake out of your system early, so that you'll remember to write down that c when it counts. Here's a plot of the function t squared in blue, along with the integral t cubed divided by 3 plus a constant in green. The fact that I can move the green curve up and down is supposed to help you to remember to add the constant c. Let's go back to the first example, where we want to find the antiderivative of 4t. To integrate 4t, the first thing we can do is pull a constant 4 out of the integral and have 4 times the integral of t. Do you recognize t as a power function? It is t to the power of 1. Increase the exponent to 2, divide by 2, and we're done. Once we remember to add the constant c. Here's the same plot of the solution, which we can move up and down. It'd be boring if we always used the same variable t. Let's take an integral with respect to the variable x. This time we have a polynomial with three terms, 2x cubed minus 4x plus 1. To integrate, we separate the terms into different integrals and apply the power rule to all three. Wait a minute, what do we do about the number 1? Well, let's think of 1 as x to the power of 0. Then we can use the power rule again. We add 1 to each exponent and divide by the exponent. When we simplify, we get the result x to the power of 4 divided by 2 minus 2x squared plus x plus our constant c. The graph of the function f and its antiderivative look a little more complicated here. But notice that whenever f, in blue, is positive, the antiderivative, in green, is increasing. When f is negative, the antiderivative is decreasing. This relationship holds even if I move the graph of the antiderivative up or down. OK, we are getting good at this. Let's increase our repertoire of functions by adding the exponential function to the list. Differentiating the exponential function is easy we get the function back again. Hence, integrating the function is equally easy. We get the function back again, with the only difference being the constant c. Do you remember how to differentiate e to the power of 3t? The factor 3 just comes down to multiply the exponential. Therefore, if we are integrating 3 times e to the 3t, the result is e to the 3t, plus a constant. We can use any constant k instead of 3 and the result holds. The integral of k times e to the kt is the function e to the kt plus a constant. We can now handle an example where we add a number to an exponential. Just break it up into two integrals. Okay, we didn't exactly have 5 times e to the 5t in this example, but we can factor out a 2 to give us the form we want. We end up with 3t plus 2 times our exponential, with a c at the end for completeness. What about the integral of e to the 7x, where we don't have a 7 in front like our rule demands? Well, just multiply by the 7 to put it where we need it, and multiply by 1 7 to undo it. Now we have 1 7 times our exponential plus a constant. Our power rule works just fine as long as the exponent n is not negative 1. But we'd also like to be able to integrate 1 over t, which is the case when n equals negative 1. What can we do? We have to think beyond power functions. We have to remember our derivative rules and realize that 1 over t did show up somewhere. The derivative of the logarithm of t is 1 over t. That was handy. Now we can reverse the rule and determine that the integral of 1 over t must be the logarithm plus a constant. That looks good, but we're actually missing something. To see the problem, let's take a look at the graph of 1 over t and its antiderivative. Notice how 1 over t is defined for both positive and negative values of t. 
Therefore, its integral should also be defined for positive and negative t. The logarithm, however, is only defined for positive t. We can't take the logarithm of a negative number and get a real result. How do we fix this? Notice that the integral of 1 over t is symmetric for negative t. We can turn our logarithm into a symmetric function by first taking the absolute value of t before taking the logarithm. That doesn't change anything for positive t and gives us the result we need for negative t. The correct rule for the integral of 1 over t is the logarithm of the absolute value of t plus the constant c. With this rule in hand, you can integrate 1 over t plus another function by breaking up the integral. You can also integrate more complicated functions with t in the denominator. But I think we should take a break now. Just remember, to differentiate a function with terms that are powers, exponentials, and logarithms, break up the integral into each term separately, and use these rules to find the antiderivative of your function.